The big 14-inch gun turrets are certainly what draw the most attention on Battleship Texas. Each weighs more than 530 tons and has two gun barrels that extend about 40 feet out of them. What isn't always understood is what we see here are merely the tops of massive structures extending deep into the ship that are connected and rotate with them. Before we take a climb through a turret's rotating structure, let's have a quick orientation that will help everything make sense. Here is an internal profile of the ship that shows how each identically constructed turret extends down to its handling room. One thing to note is that all five turrets are mounted at different heights. This is especially true of superfiring turrets 2 and 4 because they sit about 12 feet above 1 and 5, allowing them to fire over the lower turrets. Since all five turrets are identical, this creates a problem. A closer look at turrets 1 and 2 shows their 12 foot height difference. This is a problem that must be overcome since both must extend down to their respective handling rooms that sit on the same level. Fortunately, there is a fairly simple solution. The gap between each turret and its handling room is filled with a section called the circle deck. This is the only section of the entire turret structure that must be custom built. It's a fairly simple splice that is designed to lengthen the turret structure and is specifically built to meet each turret's height requirement. It also acts to continue the support structure, ammo hoist, and electrical and compressed air lines from below to the turret structures above. This is where we'll start the video tour. The first ladder climb will take us to the circle deck. We'll take a quick look around and then up another ladder to the shell deck or upper handling room. Once we've gotten our bearings, we'll take yet another ladder up past the electrical flat and into the gun pit or gun well. If you've watched a couple of my other videos, you're now in familiar territory. There is one last climb up and into the gun house where the gun crew was stationed. The final ladder is a short climb out of the turret through an emergency escape hatch in the turret commander's booth. Okay, let's go to the video and start the climb. All right, so we are entering the handling room for turret uh, one, and uh, it's in here that uh, projectiles came in from their magazines and were loaded onto the lower hoists, and then also shell, uh, powder was brought in through these powder scuttles. The two doors on each side are what were, used, were normally closed, and so that uh, pro uh, provided uh, a very high level of safety as far as isolating any possible accidents. The powder scuttles, uh, powder was brought through here, and then it was uh, taken around to the powder hoist, where it was sent up to the uh, powder flat, or also called the uh, dividing room. Now, one other thing that's very important to notice is if you look up, you'll see this circular track that goes around the entire thing, the entire structure. Everything inside of that track moves. There's the center column, and it's in that that electricity and also uh, uh, compressed air supplies were sent up. So that means that the hoists, both the powder and the two projectile hoists, also rotated with it, which certainly complicated things. Now we're gonna go ahead and climb up to the uh, circle deck for turret one. So here we are on the turret two circle deck. This is where they make up the space and you can, uh, between turrets one and two, and you can see, uh, you'll see in a, in a minute, the vast difference between it and the circle deck for turret one. But a couple of things to show you in here. First of all, I'm hitting my head in, in camera, I'm sure. It's hard to get in a position here. We have actually three rectangular shafts that go up. The center one, is the uh, powered powder hoist that takes the powder bags from below up to the dividing room. These other two that have a ladder on them are actually manual hoists. If there's a failure of the uh, powered hoist, then crew members could climb that ladder and from a position above, they could uh, move, push that powder into the uh, dividing room. The powder would be hoisted up using block and tackle. So that's pretty much all we have here. And uh, our next uh, 
uh, point will be climbing up to the shell deck or upper handling room. So here's what it looks like in the uh, circle deck for turret two. As you can see, it's vastly taller. Uh, and that's because this is where we make up the difference in the heights between turrets one and two. Uh, what this also does though, because of this extra height, is it get, provided them with an opportunity to store more 14 inch projectiles. Now, I do not know that this is a fact, but I did read that this was the uh, preferred location to store target and handling rounds where they practiced uh, moving rounds, loading them, moving them up and down hoists, and then also practice firing. Here's a dummy round that sit in a storage location. Oddly, that little string that's holding it together is not too far from the truth. Now, what they did was they actually lashed the two loops together with uh, a heavier hemp rope, and if they needed the projectile, then they would simply cut the rope and then move it. If you look above, you can see the tracks that are up there, and these are what chain trolleys, hoists, were mounted to and to move the shell around. And then from there, here's an upper, here's a lower ammo hoist, and this is where they could actually stop the chain, hook the projectile to it, and send it up to the uh, upper handling room or shell deck. All right, so we have just climbed up that ladder from the circle deck, and we're now on the upper, in the upper handling room, also known as the shell flat. It's in here that they could store up to 30 shells. This is also where they took the projectiles off the lower hoist that were pulled up using this chain type hoist. They come up through these safety doors and then from there they could either be moved over to storage or they could be moved onto the upper hoist like we see here where there's a dummy shell sitting in its shell car and waiting to go up into the turret. Now, if you look at the overhead, you'll see that uh, like below, they have these tracks that were used to, uh, along with uh, what they call chain trolleys, which are movable blocks and tackles. And with that, they could move the shells around. Now, stepping over this uh, open hatch, let's go around to this side. Basically, we've got the same thing on both sides, but in this case, the door is open. If we look past the storage rack and through that opening, that's the route we would take to go up to the chain falls where the turrets could be manually uh, trained or the guns elevated. This short ladder here takes you up into a blower room and then from there into the uh, powder flat or also called the dividing room where powder was then split up at the top of the hoist to go to either the left or right hand gun. Now, as you can see on the, uh, on the lower hoist, the chain type hoist, uh, we have the handle that's used to raise or lower it, uh, the shell, and then also here's a chain. If there should be a motor or any kind of drive failure, they could then use this chain to manually hoist it, but I'm sure at a much, much slower rate. Now, uh, one thing also to mention in here is that I'm certain, even though this is strictly my conclusion, that this was the preferred location to move shells. They would, they would keep a full set of both high capacity and armor piercing shells here because they, by moving shells from here into the turret, you completely eliminated the time and effort required to bring them up from the uh, lower magazines. However, but that didn't mean that they weren't moving shells from there because as they supplied shells from this to the upper hoist and then to the guns, they could be bringing up replacements uh, even though at a much lower rate, of course, but they wouldn't just simply run out as soon as they fired all 30 rounds. One last thing to note that I think is particularly cool is that the, uh, this is a multi-speed motor used for the upper hoist, but it only traveled in one direction. But it had to be able to travel in two directions by, uh, in order to either raise or lower shells. So what they have is a planetary gear set up here that would effectively reverse the action of the motor. And this is the handle 
that they would use to reverse it. So there's a little safety lever on it. You grab that lever and you push or pull the, pull the lever one way or the other. And then here is the speed controller for it. So they would vary the speed of the hoist with this and then reverse directions with that. So with that, uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to step up on this uh, upper hoist motor and use that as our first step for a ladder that's going to take us ultimately to the uh, gun pit, but we're going to make a stop along the way in the electrical flat. So here we are at the electrical flat. We've just come up from the uh, shell deck and are just below the turret pit. But this is the heart of the electrical system for each turret. Major power was brought in through that central column. From there it was split up and distributed either as lighting or as power for the various motors, whether they're blower motors, hoist motors, training or elevating motors. Uh, there's also these large black boxes, a number of them. Let's see if we can get around and show you a little better. There are a number of these boxes in here. And uh, in fact, the lower one still has a tag on it that says right ram. These are basically speed controllers. And so using resistor banks and the line switching them in and out, they could vary the speed of the motors. So obviously it took a very small and skinny electrician to get in here and do any work. Okay, we're now going to climb up into the uh, gun pit. Okay, so we just climbed this ladder that came up from the shell deck and also the uh, electrical flat and we're standing in the gun pit. Now I'm sure this is going to be familiar to most of you if you've seen my other videos. But uh, up ahead where the pointer and trainer sat underneath the gun barrel and its slide to control the turret rotation and elevation of the guns. We have the machinery like the big elevating screw that's attached to the gun's yoke. And then also that silent chain, if you watched my training video, you can see that this one is covered with a protective guard. So up close to closer to us is this aluminum tray and this powder scuttle door that's opened. This is where powder ultimately came up and slid out onto this tray and then two powder passers or sometimes called well men uh, stood down here and they passed up powder to two loaders that were standing on this tray where they were then set on the loading tray and rammed into the breech of the gun. So we're going to go ahead now and climb up to that to, to the gun house and take a quick look around. So we just climbed a little ladder on the uh, bulkhead up from the gun pit shown there and are now standing in the turret house. Obviously this is where the gun crew was. The two powder passers or loaders standing on that platform would shove powder bags into the breech and would certainly be helped along by the rammer man. And here we have an actual demilitarized 14 inch projectile sitting on the tray and ready to be rammed into the breach. The, uh, there was a uh, rammer man, or I'm sorry, a, an upper hoist man who controlled the, or sent telegraph messages to the shell deck telling them whether to raise or lower. And then also we had a variety of guys, instead, including a rammer man who stood back here behind this door over on this side. There are a number of other people in here, but we're not going to discuss procedures or actual manning levels now. We're going to save that for a later video. So next we're going to step into the turret commander's booth. This is who supervised the entire turret's operation and, uh, could, and behind this plexiglass are all of his controls including a very high precision turret train indicator but he had all the warning lights everything that he needed to do his work. Now we've got the metal grids over the doors instead of solid doors leading into the gun houses or uh, gun sleeves and then also this plexiglass in place because this particular turret is the one that was open to the public and allowed them to at least step up into here and look into it. So now the last step is we will climb down this short ladder through an emergency escape hatch 
And that will basically end the tour. So to give you a little perspective, this is the escape hatch we just climbed out of. And we are now outside where we can see the whole turret. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, we're going to be doing more videos in the not too distant future that uh, give a much more detailed description of the actual procedures and manning of every position in the turret and how the uh, powder moved on its own and how the projectiles moved from the magazines up to the loading tray and into the breech.